Well, hello again, everyone. Today we are taking a brief look at some of the differences between godliness and worldliness. We often hear the saying that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. But what does that really mean, especially when we consider some of the topical issues which we are facing in our world today? Our scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Few challenges have been more troublesome for believers down through the ages than the challenge of worldliness. And we often hear that although we are in the world, we're not of the world. We struggle with that because it's a lot easier said than done. And in an effort to become relevant to, and, and to reach our culture, there is a very real danger that we become just like the culture we're living in. And we begin to lose our distinctiveness as Christians. And then along with that, we tend to lose our understanding of the power of the gospel to bring about true change. And we're warned of this in Romans chapter 12 from verse 2, when Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Worldliness at its very heart is a matter of the heart. Because if your heart is captured by the world, you will love the things of the world. If your heart is captured by your love for God, you will be drawn to Him and to the things of God. The thing is, though, that the only way that our hearts can be truly transformed so that we can love, by, love God is by the supernatural new birth, which Jesus talks to Nicodemus about in John chapter 3. To be worldly is to think and to act out of selfishness, greed, pride and personal ambition. It's to have a selfish desire for the things that we do not have and at the same time to have a sinful pride in the things that we do have. So rather than living to please God who examines the heart, the worldly person lives for self. But our love for God should be a ruling principle in our lives. And the only way that we can overcome a strong desire of the flesh and the world is to be consumed with loving God instead. Because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, loving Him in response should become a priority in our lives. And it's interesting that often when the Bible speaks of commandments, it refers to the desires of our hearts and the affections of our hearts. For instance, the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jonathan Edwards was a great preacher of the early 18th century, and he wrote, True religion, in great part, consists in holy affections. And he's right. If your heart is cold toward the things of God, and is captivated by the things of the world instead, then when we get to that stage, we need to be asking ourselves, do I really belong to the Father or to the world? Any love relationship must be maintained, and this is true of our relationship with God as well. And it's especially true because Satan will constantly try to draw us away from God's love with all of the temptations of the world as well. And as John writes in verse 16, Everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. Classic example is what happened to Adam and Eve. They saw that the forbidden fruit was good for food, which appealed to the lust of the flesh. They saw it was a delight to the eyes, and this appealed to the lust of the eyes. And they also saw that the tree was desirable to make them wise, and this appealed to their sense of pride. Lust refers to a strong desire or an impulse. And flesh, in a biblical context, refers to our fallen nature. And this fallen nature is not completely destroyed at salvation. We continue to struggle against the lusts of the flesh 
even after we are saved. The lust of the flesh includes any strong desire or inclination of our fallen nature, because at its very core is the self-seeking, godless nature that we are born with. The Apostle Paul at the end of Romans chapter 1 it gives us a vivid and a stark picture of the state of the fallen human heart. And he gets right to the heart of the issue. He says they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. That's a very clear picture of the human nature that we see around us. Now, of course, proclaiming this reality in a world which has bought into the lie that we're all essentially good people is not a popular message. But the truth hurts. The howls of derision and anger that we hear in response to talking about the sin problem merely proves that Paul was correct when he wrote these rather cutting words in Romans chapter 1. Across the world right now, the evils of racism are quite rightly being exposed. But the truth is that racism is merely a symptom of a deeper issue. And that deeper issue is human sin. But the world doesn't want to deal with sin, because that would presuppose that God was right and we were wrong. And so we'll deal with the symptom rather than the cause. And this fundamentally is why the evil of racism will never truly be eradicated in this fallen world, no matter how hard we may try or how well-intentioned our efforts may be. Taking a knee has become a sign that any decent-minded person doing so is opposed to racism of any kind. But the problem is that the track record of the human race shows us that taking a knee and broadcasting the images on television and social media will not solve the problem. Taking to our knees before a holy God, humbly confessing that it is our sin, both personal and corporate, that is the real cause of the mess that this world is in, is the only remedy to racism and every other social ill that we see around us. Celebrities taking the knee is not the answer. Rioting and looting is not the answer. Turning to Jesus Christ is the answer. The power of the gospel is the answer. But, of course, that also means then rejecting the ways of the world and loving God instead. And unrepentant sinners cannot, and they will not do that. Paul says in Romans 8 from verse 5, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by, by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And that is the problem. The opposite of loving the world is not only loving God, but also obeying, to him, obeying him, submitting to his will, submitting to his laws. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. If we love the things or the things of the world, we, we will lose all of those things at, at the time of our death. All that the worldly person lives for is gone in an instant and means nothing in the light of eternity. Even if we achieve all that we want to during our lives, what benefit are those things at death? But if we do the will of God, we will be storing treasures in heaven. 
The only way that we can make a real difference in this world and the mess that it is in is by confessing our own sin, turning to Jesus Christ in repentance, and then calling others to repentance. However, we need to be absolutely clear on this. This message will not be well received. It will not be welcomed. But proclaim it we must. Because salvation in Jesus Christ is the only remedy. And again from Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. God bless you.